Hey, let's talk about uh, the next phylum we want to talk about, which are the bryozoans. So, um, first off, let's just kind of talk about class organization. If you look at your um, phylogenetic tree that's in your book or that I gave you, you'll recognize that we're skipping a lot of phyla. Uh, we just don't have time to cover every phyla. Um, there might be something like 8 million animal species on Earth, and we're just not going to be able to cover all of those. And so there are a lot of these um, unique phyla that are interesting, but we just don't have time to cover them. I'm just trying to hit the, the more common phyla, especially the ones you're going to get here in Kentucky. So, for example, um, how cool is this, right? There's uh, this one particular phylum, and they're only found living in the mouth parts of crustaceans in the northern hemisphere. Um, that's crazy, right? That's really cool, and there's tons of examples like this. There's so much stuff that needs to be discovered out there, and you can never get tired of it. Um, but the fact that we're skipping some of these is, does not indicate that they're not important or they're not interesting. Um, we just don't have the time in an introductory zoology class. But I am going to try and hit some that um, at least are things that you're going to find in Kentucky. And um, the first of these, or the next one that we're going to talk about, are the bryozoans, okay? And this is a colonial organism, and I bring these up because these are really noticeable in Kentucky Lake. And if you're ever out on the lake, you're going to see these things, and so they're very interesting, they're, um, and so I thought it'd be important to talk about them. The individuals are called zoids, and it's another colonial organism that we've talked about, you know, like the other ones that we've talked about before. Um, you, For example, the Portuguese man of war was a, a colonial organism that had a bunch of multicellular individuals that lived together. These individuals have a structure called a lophophore, and that's the important structure um, to bryozoans. Um, this lophophore is a structure that has like tentacles with cilia on it, so it's very similar to the hydra that we looked like, but it doesn't have the stinging threads. Um, and these tentacles are used for feeding, and so they kind of filter feed and grab food particles out of the water. But they're also used for gas exchange. So again, we're looking at organisms that are a little bit more complicated, and so instead of just feeding, they also are able to absorb oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide through this lophophore. Um, the other interesting thing is you've got this colony of these individuals, and they all secrete an exoskeleton, and that exoskeleton is called zoecium. Now, um, this is a lot like the corals we talked about before, right? You talked about the corals, and, and they had a, a soft center, but they secreted a very hard exoskeleton, and then when the the animal dies, that exoskeleton is left behind, and that's how you get a coral reef. And this is in a similar way, they, uh, these bryozoans secrete an exoskeleton, but it's a lot different than a coral exoskeleton. Um, some people uh, like to call these bryozoans freshwater sponges. They're not, okay? We talked about that there, there are freshwater sponges, and they're in the phylum periphery, and they're true sponges, and we have those in Kentucky. These are a completely different phylum. Um, the phylum is called, sometimes it's called bryozoa, but I think it's probably more appropriately called ectoprocta. Anyway, um, these are not true sponges, but you can see why people would call them sponges, because they sort of filter the water and filter feed like a sponge would. Um, but they're, again, they're also very similar to cnidarians like corals, in that they can secrete this exoskeleton, or they can live in a colony of individuals. So um, they're similar to these other uh, animals, but they are also different. So here is a picture of the lophophore, um, and uh, actually a um, picture of a bunch of individuals, and you can see the lophophore on the zoomed in version of this. And so if you look at the structure here, you can see there's a little bit more complexity relatively compared to the tentacles of a hydra. You can see that um, you've got muscles attached to the lophophore. 
and you've got this uh, operculum, um, which is also a cap. And so if the bryozoan is disturbed, these muscles can retract this lophophore. You know, this lophophore is going to be very important to the bryozoan, and it's also very delicate, and so you want to protect it. Um, and I've got some videos that I'll show you in lab of what this looks like when these are all retracted. Um, and so you can extend the loaf of four when you're feeding and when you need to do gas exchange, and then you can retract it and, and close it with this cap. And um, so this is what one looks like in the wild. And so this is what you're going to find. You'll see these all over the place in Kentucky Lake in the shoreline, growing on stick-ups, growing on docks. That zoecium that is secreted by the individuals is gelatinous. It's a really interesting texture. And when it warms up, I'll go and grab one and I'll bring it in and show it to you. It's a very unique texture. It's definitely not like coral. It's not hard like a coral, but it is secreted like corals are. Um, are. And here's another example. And again, this is where a lot of you are going to see these. They're going to grow attached to submerged sticks and things. And when the water level goes down, you'll see them a lot. Um, anyway, this is a unique organism. It's in its own phylum, and um, I think they're pretty interesting. And um, hopefully, like I said, later in the year I'll have some specimens for you, and I definitely will have some videos of these for you later. And that's it for the Ectopracta. So thanks a lot. Talk to you later.